the main problem that I'm focused on is this fact that AI capabilities are outracing or outpacing human capacity for review. I think that this is actually very separable and separate from the idea that uh, superintelligence might be malicious or that some people with AI might be far more powerful than other people with AI. Um, it's, this isn't really about, this, this is connected to, but not perfectly overlapping with the idea of alignment. If you can solve alignment, if you can take everything you value and embed it or encode it into an agent somehow, then you don't have to review. I think review, like alignment tries to punt this problem and say, we'll solve the general case, it'll be fine, you don't have to worry about it. I am very worried about this because this is a problem now and you can easily extrapolate from here through transformative AI to super intelligence and just see this start qualitatively getting worse without seeing any clear threshold of like, oh, we've hit transformative AI, this is clearly gonna start breaking now. Like you can see the cracks starting to form now where you get responses today and it's easy to review many of them. You can see, you can look at these images that are getting generated and say, this text doesn't look right. There's something wrong with it, regenerate it, or this isn't what I wanted. But as these things become movies, as these things become books, as these things become code libraries that are getting generated, it gets, or business models and plans, or trading strategies, you can start to see that the ability to understand and review becomes integral to ensuring that these systems are doing what we want them to actually do. And you might be able to solve alignment and sweep that under the rug, but for now, everyone that I know who actively uses an AI model or agent in some respect, use, treats it as a very capable but untrustworthy collaborator rather than someone that you can trust you can trustingly delegate anything to. And that's why things like Zoom's decision to try and give you an AI delegate for Zoom meetings fell flat on its face, in my opinion. I'm worried about the uh, eventual potential Shogoth that might show up, but this is more or less out of scope of what I'll be talking about now. Um, I also worry that we have demonstrations of safety, the way we think about how you should have uh, how you should show if a model is safe now looks a lot like saying this railing is totally safe. Look how hard I can throw my body against it. And this obviously works really well until it doesn't. Um, but the interesting thing is this isn't how we test safety railings <laughs> in reality. Um, like you, you get warning labels on things. Elevators have max load capacities. So what would it look like to have something like that for AI? The future that I am building toward is something where we don't have, and this is, the light colors bled, bled out a little bit, so I'll try and talk through it. Um, the current workflow roughly looks like users work with, or generate some kind of informal spec, and from that you get uh, that passed to a solution generator, which gives you a candidate solution, you review that, or you send that into the world, and that is your approved solution. And you can see this workflow in action with Copilot, which has been shown in at least one experiment to have more, vulnerability, more security vulnerabilities be less stable um, than code that was not generated with an AI uh, partner. And uh, that was a, I don't have it cited, but that was a work by Dan Bonet, um, or Dan Bonet's group. I think instead we could have a uh, workflow where Users work with specification assistance to generate something that specifies objective criteria of what success or failure looks like for a given domain. From that, you generate a solution as well as a proof that your solution meets that specification. And then you can very trivially check that, oh yes, in fact, these are the, the criteria that I care about in my solution, and this is, like sufficiently confidence-inspiring validation that this solution does in fact have these properties. But uh, rewinding a little bit, that's the problem I'm trying to solve and what we'll be mostly talking about, but uh, I think the how I got here and the perspective and path dependence is somewhat interesting. I am not an expert in any of the fields I am going to be talking about, and I acknowledge this. My role at this point is not taking 
my expertise and applying it to things. My role is in gathering experts to solve the relevant problems, which is probably why I'm here talking about field building. I have been at the cutting edge of a field. This is me doing an applied physics PhD. After I finished that, I got uh, talked into embedding human rights into digital infrastructure um, with the most ambitious startup that I think I've come across to this day. And uh, I was tasked with building out the grants program. The grants program, as uh, for those of you who were at the uh, opening session yesterday for the week, you'll recognize that I mentioned that the best possible grants program is the most, or be more better science, faster and cheaper. Faster and cheaper are very objective, more and better are very subjective, and you need a lot of robust tools to be able to elicit different people's entirely valid but conflicting subjective preferences about what better science is. Um, how to distinguish whether this piece of, whether this breakthrough is more than that breakthrough um, or better in some way. And that led into building out a venture studio that was focused on delivering coordination tools for large groups of people to elicit and aggregate these preferences in order to specifically fund public goods and commons. This uh, Venture Studio was focused on revolutionary coordination systems. The idea that, and this was my favorite slide from my time at Protocol Labs, uh, you have all of these coordination systems like insurance or capital markets or the metric system or GPS, where it's very clear to, it, it's very easy to realize that at some point those didn't exist. But someone one day thought, what would it be like if we had a tool that lets you do this thing and could fancifully describe what the world might be like if it were more widely adopted? And now these things have become the fabric of society that really massively expand how fast civilization can move as per this Alfred North Whitehead quote, that civilization advances by extending the number of important operations that you can perform without thinking about them. It's not about getting people to be more thoughtful about all the things they do, it's about empowering them with coordination tools that help them achieve more with almost effortlessly in the same way that printing presses and democracies and the internet allow you to share information and coordinate and uh, distribute resources and do things like that. So the thought was all of these things have become so useful that they are being applied in instances where I would argue they are not a good fit anymore. And many of the inefficiencies that we might be seeing could be traced back to trying to put insurance in places where it doesn't belong or markets in places where it doesn't belong. And so the thought became, what if you built mechanisms that were intended to scale to at least as big as you think they could, or were intended to scale to the maximum possible impact so you don't have these runaway externalities after they achieve adoption beyond the scope that you had? What if we had these specifically to, to support things like knowledge creation and open source software? And so we ended up spinning out six things that I, or five tools, uh, nonprofits or companies that were advancing specific tools and funding the commons, like a conference series that's focused on exactly this type of coordination tool building. And one of the projects that was not on that list that we spun out was this open agency architecture for safe transformative AI. Um, I like to point to this odd, odd looking note about the quality bar here being worth the reader's time rather than the best possible argument I can make for this um, when Davidad wrote this. And I consider that, that lowering of his quality bar my first contribution to the field of AI safety. Um, this has now become Safeguarded AI, a 59 million uh, British pound research pro backed research program uh, funded by UK's ARIA. And this is really de-risking this particular approach. But let me uh, go into what I am doing and I'll get into how it integrates into that, that approach in the broader category in a moment. Uh, I mentioned this challenge of review of systems and I think that you can try and look at, the, look at AI issues the way that most people are out in the world where they see technology, technological capabilities that are growing quite generally and 
fail, falling down in similar ways across all of these categories. And you could say, we need a general solution to limit or um, improve or fix this general technology. But I think that it's far easier to look at the landscape as we see it, as we manage it for the general intelligences that we have now, human actors, where we don't set one set of moral policies or codes that everyone has to abide by and we enforce it and that's how we keep people from committing crimes. We have the definition for what crimes are in a lot of different domains. And so I think that there's a, a very interesting perspective that AI is going to be driving progress in each of these domains. There is some benefits that will be provided by the technology of this scalable language processing and information processing, but this risk that we are outpacing human oversight in each of these domains brings with it specific challenges in each of these topics. And so, for example, um, patching legal ambiguities versus finding legal loopholes is an example that I don't think anyone talks about nearly as much as they should. I think there are some libertarians out there who are going to be very excited about the fact that I predict tax revenues may one year with the release of a good language model drop by double digit percentages. And I think that you could argue that it's good that everyone should have access to the world, a world class tax council, but you could also imagine what that's going to do to all of our public infrastructure. And the idea of half of American states defaulting or going bank, having to declare, declare bankruptcy probably sounds like a scenario you don't want to participate, live through, participate in. I think that there is some insight to looking at the scalability of review and saying, what for each of these domains would it look like to have tools to make review more, human review more scalable? I think even those who, even people who don't like regulation and government oversight would agree that if you could make that government oversight lower latency for the same quality bar or even a higher quality bar with more transparency, that this would be a better outcome. There's also the challenge that when we don't have oversight or review, we'll lean to on proxies for that review. And what that starts to look like is, is this agent profitable? And I think that there's a catastrophic scenario in which everyone is deploying agents as quickly as possible, as irresponsibly as possible, in order to you and only using prof profits as a proxy for is this system aligned with my goals? And I think that at this point, the world becomes completely intractable, un in uninterpretable to the humans who are presumably still operating the machines, but we've built this infrastructure of coordination tool so that people don't even know the ends to which they are working in many of these instances. So we could lose control to not even a super intelligence, but you know, if enough language models are put in control of business decisions, uh, many, the majority of humans would start acting out the will of a, a non-super intelligent, not even transformative AI that was just enacting things that we didn't have a good way of generating insights into. I think that if you use specifications, if you don't wholly try to encode what you're optimizing for, but you just say, these are, these are guardrails, these are bad behaviors, these are things that I don't want solutions to implement, and then you make tools to make it very easy to be very expressive in those languages, you should be able to get tools that also allow AI output, or to allow you to verify AI, AI outputs against those specifications. And I think that this is a really compelling direction. And so uh, what I am doing is more or less going through each of, uh, each of the types of AI risk as I see them, one domain at a time, and saying, are experts aware of these risks? Do we have specification languages? Do we have ways of generating specification solutions and checking those solutions? and building these actual tools, trying to get them in front of actual users. Uh, specifically, we can look through what this workflow looks like in some of these domains. 
Um, the first area we're looking at is formal verification. If you're talking about specifications, we have specification languages in formal verification. This is a tool for expressing constraints on the state or outputs of programs. And it's incredibly valuable, incredibly useful and effective at pr proving security and stability properties, but it's incredibly expensive to use. And so the, the challenge becomes, is it possible for us before AI starts generating much of our code for us with decreasing amounts of review, could we have language models generate code and specifications and proofs that those code that code is meeting these specifications. And so um, the current status is that we're looking at, it, at the subset of this of can I take legacy code and generate updated verified code, um, specifically looking at mapping from Fortran or C to um, a verified subset of C or a verified subset of Rust. Um, this is something where as AI capabilities grow, the problem seems like it gets easier actually in a lot of senses, but it's also not trivial in that there are still UX questions that have to be answered. There are still customer acquisition questions that have to be answered and, so, and work that has to be done. And so we're really interested in actually doing that work. In about a month, we're going to be releasing a report. We're currently at about 50 pages of projects, or I think 15 projects now, where they are individual tools where if you are going to do this uplifting of C to Rust, or if, like C or Fortran to Rust, these are the tools that you will want to have in your arsenal to automate as much of that workflow as possible. And once we're done with the map, we're gonna start building these. Uh, the second domain that I think is very compelling is this idea of small molecule biochemistry uh, particular interest in small molecules because you don't have catastrophic self-replication risks, but you do have this potential to build tools that help you dramatically better understand the systems you're modifying rather than just get suggested modifications you could throw at these systems to see if they in fact do what you want. So rather than having tools that let you identify new potential drugs, I think it's far more compelling to have something like a competition as an analog to CASP, the competition that AlphaFold became famous for more or less winning, where instead of going from amino acid sequence to structure, I want to go from small molecule to how toxic is this molecule? And there is a lot of open science that has to be done here, but I would love to redirect interest from current directions of uh, trying to generate new types of molecules that do different types of things that pharma companies are interested in to instead growing our understanding of the system and combining interests between researchers in the life sciences who are trying to understand these systems and people who are building AI systems at the frontier. Once you have this, you could start, you could imagine a pipeline where you get to specify what it means for a drug to be toxic or to modify a pathway significantly. And those are subjective preferences or desires that you might have as a user, but they be, get turned into objective criteria that you can then check and you don't have to trust the AI that it is not toxic for the AI's interpretation of non-toxic. A really nice property of these, these objective specifications is that they're compatible with existing governance processes. Governments are already very accustomed to setting laws. People are already accustomed to setting rules. And the nice thing about rules is that they stack. You don't want to stack optimization targets because those start competing with each other. But if you start, if you stack specifications, then you could imagine or try to understand better why specifications are being set at different levels. Uh -huh. The very long-term goal that I would aspire to is having something that looks like an international standards organization for setting these specifications so that you have something at an international level where people agree if you're making model, if, you're, if you have AIs that are creating outputs, those outputs should not be self-replicating, for instance, um, in an uncontrolled way, except for a few maybe narrow cases. And those can stack on top of national or state or individual preferences that you might have based on what you want from your AI outputs. Um, we are structured as a nonprofit. I believe this is a solution that is 
valuable enough that I don't want this to be viewed as a competitive advantage to be kept from other people or to be avoided by our competitors. I hope that we will spin out for profits and or help external formation of for profits. And I would want that the next day, if a competitor to that for profit comes to us and says, we also want to adopt that, that whoever is in the leadership seat for Atlas Computing, that I have to then go and help that competitor to this thing that I just helped build. Because I really want this to be something that is available to everyone. Um, this is part of a broader safety agenda. If you're worried about that uh, world-ending, uh, that super self-improving superintelligence, there is a category of researcher, there's a set of researchers talking about this category of guaranteed safe AI, where your AI systems should have a separable, auditable world model um, that lets you simulate, if I put this into the world, what then happens? Um, and you can create specifications that define safety in terms of states of that model, and that there's some kind of verifier that validates proposals that an AI would output against the specifications in the context of that model. Uh, for those interested in learning more about that, uh, here is a paper, uh, QR code to that paper. Uh, this was co-authored by Davidad, the researcher that I mentioned, as well as Yashua Bengio, Stuart Russell, Max Tegmark, Steve Omohundro. Steve Omohundro. Uh, and I think that this is a very promising direction. Much of this is still very much in the exploratory research stage. And the most concrete proposal in this general direction is Davidad's safeguarded AI program at ARIA that I've already mentioned. These are trying to build a foundation and a scaffold by which you could generalize this proposal to have uh, verifiably safe AI. But it is unlikely that, I don't think that they have any plans to deliver useful tools following this architecture within the next two years. Their timeline is kind of three plus years. And I really hope that there are user experience problems and customer acquisition problems that we can start solving more or less today so that when these programs fit, or when this program finishes, we can take that technology and immediately deliver to users who are already used to this workflow and understand what it means to generate specs that bind AI. Uh, if you look more at safeguarded AI, you'll see complex diagrams like this. I like to simplify this diagram down to this. You can see the color scheme roughly matches, and it's uh, a much simplified stakeholders will implement, will contribute scientific theories to a GitHub for multi-physics simulation as well as giving requirements, which then gets passed to a proof generator and solution generator, and that outputs a solution with proof to the proof checker. Um, you'll also see a diagram like this, which is all of the things that Davidad intends to build for his uh, program, and on the left there, I have my shorthand for how I think of these. Uh, start off with a composable modeling language. This is a domain-specific language plus Git plus CI, but for scientific theories. You should be able to contribute. So frequently, there's the question of, well, formal verification is great. It's avoided a lot of airplane crashes, but airplanes still crash, and when they do, it's because there's a gap between the, what the airplane understands the state of the world to be and what the actual state of the world is. How do you address that for these AI systems? And I have the cynical, I have the um, adversarial response of, well, of course the, solution, the issues are going to fall in the gap between the model and reality. If there were an issue in the model itself, formal verification would have caught it. And so you don't have, you can, if you can exclude any issues there, and so you have survivorship bias by looking at this as a net, if you assume this is a net worse situation. That said, uh, the best way to make sure that you have a robust world model is to have this be something like, or something that's managed via a Git-like process where anyone can suggest improvements, and you can review these improvements, and you can steadily, asymptotically approach as good as humanly possible for the, this world model. Um, on top of this, the goal is to build a working Im implementation. Uh, technical area two accelerates all of these things with AI generation. And uh, 1.3 on the side here is the interface that you would use, as well as uh, technical area three, which are these example demonstrations of this capability as 
a more generalized system is built out. I do think that this has the possibility of sidestepping the aligned problem, and you could extract useful work from this aligned AI in the system. Leave it there. Thank you.